sharing history for the future, a convening with Jean Quick to see Smith. I want to acknowledge that the Whitney is on Lenape Hoking, the ancestral homeland of Lenape. And this indeed right here, what we're looking at was the site of a uh, trading post. And I remember reading stories of the oysters that were a foot long that they used to pull out of the water right in front of here. In fact, they found um, many of the oysters on the site years later. Um, the museum's current site is close to that. It was a uh, Lenape fishing village and planting site called Sinap Hanukin. Tobacco field alongside the Lenape, many other indigenous nations have ancestral ties to this place now known as New York, including the six Haudenosaunee nations, Seneca, Cayuga, Tuscarora, Mohawk, Oneida, and Onondaga, as well as Shinnecock and Puspatuck. We honor their ongoing connection to this place. If you are joining us online, please take a moment to identify and recognize the indigenous people of always and continue to steward the land from where you are joining. Last night, I was honored to be in conversation with John Quick to see Smith about her art and her life. But because it is her way to make space for others, Jean has brought together an extraordinary group of artists, curators, scholars, and educators who are collectively changing the game of American art as they address issues related to land, sovereignty, indigenous knowledge, identity, in the context of what we call the United States. Smith has been a major influence on generations of Native artists providing exposure and encouragement to hundreds of artists and many, many others over her long career. Today's program is an extension of the exhibition Jean Quick to see Smith, Memory Map, which surveys five decades of her groundbreaking work, and it is organized around three key roles that Smith has played throughout her career, artist, educator, and curator. Today's event would not have been possible without the backing of several charitable funders. And I am deeply grateful to Carl and Marilyn Toma Foundation, the Henry Luce Foundation, who have been incredible supporters of our programs for indigenous art, the Terra Foundation for American Art. I want to thank Laura Phipps, Caitlin Jason, Megan Hoyer, Megan Hoyer, <laughs> Megan Hoyer. Andrew Hawks, I love my staff, Chris Scorza. I also want to express my gratitude to Jean, not only for granting the Whitney the privilege of presenting your retrospective, but also for showing us a new way to see America and American art. It's a new beginning for the Whitney Museum. As you have expressed in a myriad of ways, Native Americans have always been here and they are still actively changing and shaping the United States. In these difficult times, which indeed they are, we have much we can learn from your art, including that we need to understand the past honestly in order to create a more just and equitable future. Thank you, Jean. Thank you for the clarity of your vision, and thank you for the generosity with which you share it. I want to end this morning, I guess, and begin this morning with a Pueblo prayer. Hold on to what is good, even if it's a handful of earth. Hold on to what you believe, even if it's a tree that stands by itself. Hold on to what you must do, even if it's a long way from here. Hold on to your life, even if it's easier to let go. Hold on to my hand, even if someday I'll be gone away from you. It is now my pleasure to introduce Joe Baker, a longtime friend of Jean's, a fellow artist, a curator, co-founder, and executive director of the Lenape Center, and a member of the Delaware Tribe of Indians. Joe, thank you for being here with us this morning. Nuhati kishilamin, kata wenawaman, nauk okinaki hauk yukawenda, my lati, kulha kaski wilita hanan, which mean a dillage, name a name, wema kekuk, nana lekech. I want to share with you a bit more about who I am. I want to show respect for my family. 
uh, who, and those people who sacrifice and courage and energy allows me to stand here before you today. Um, my name is Joe Baker. I'm an enrolled member of the Delaware Tribe of Indians, whose headquarters are located in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. I'm co-founder uh, and executive director of Lenape Center, which was founded in 2009 to push back against our erasure here in the ancestral homeland. I'm a member of the Simon White Turkey family who arrived in Indian Territory in 1867 from the last federal reserve of the main body of Lenape people in and around Kansas, Lawrence, Kansas. I am a direct line descendant of Lenape leaders, including my third great grandfather, Anderson Sarkoxy, who signed the um, Treaty of Greenville in 1795. Fourth great grandfather, White Eyes, who in 1778 negotiated the first treaty with the newly formed U.S. government, the Treaty of Fort Pitt, which was to establish an all Lenape state, the 14th state, with representation in Congress. White Ice was assassinated by the U.S. militia that same year. Fifth great-grandfather, Netawadis, who negotiated the Treaty of Conestoga. Sixth great-grandfather, Chief Nudimus, who co-signed under protest the walking purchase. And finally, seventh great-grandfather, Taminan, King Tammany, who welcomed and negotiated the first peace treaty with William Penn on these very shores. I also want to share with you a story that moves forward into time and connects to my childhood. And that's a story about tribal elder Nora Thompson Dean. Forty years ago, she got in her little Ford Falcon station wagon and headed east to her ancestral homeland. The purpose of her visit was to give a paper at the Indian Symposium at Seton Hall University. It was a great success. There were over 800 <laughs> attendees in the room that day. But a legend grew up around another leg of the trip. And that to me is the most important because she traveled with her students into New York City for a meeting with Mayor Koch, the mayor who never showed up. She waited with her students, and eventually Mayor Koch's assistant came out of the offices and presented her a souvenir pin of the city of New York. And I think about what kind of cultural jumpstart could have been made had they been given a proper audience? Much like what's happening here at the Whitney Museum, where the doors have been open for young Native artists through the visionary work of the artists that we celebrate here today, John Quick to see Smith. Imagine what could have happened 40 years ago. And it's particularly true in the city of New York that is a city that's full of stories of many people. But absent are the stories of first people, the Lenape. And then thinking about last night and thinking about today with the excitement of what we might be able to explore, I was thinking about one of the Lenape virtues. And I think that resonates, and I want to quickly share that with you uh, this morning. And that is, we are all relatives. Respect all relations. This value, Lenape value, stresses the interconnectivity of all things. Indeed, 
the land, the sky, and all of life exist as an inter interdependent, interconnected web. There's no single element that is void of place and embodiment. I believe this represents an alternative solution to the toxic individualism created by colonial capitalist society today. We as a species have largely forgotten the right relationship with the earth, while those who do remember are not being given agency to express that. In short, when we left, the land remembered. Recognizing and remaking those connections are necessary to healing and to our collective future. Wanishi. Please welcome Peter Jemison. Now I scan out Swagwego on Nanda Waga ni a gun known the death down ni Gyaso. Got ni going neo, then get my niece a day, then get your go at them. In our language, when we gather, we give each other a greeting of, I give thanks that you are well. And when it's a, a large group, we say, Now I scan out Swagwego, giving thanks for all of you and your well being. In our language, we don't call ourselves Seneca. The word Seneca has no meaning. We call ourselves Onondawaga, which translates to mean the people of a great hill. And we trace that great hill to the shore, uh, the southeastern shore of Lake Canandaigua, one of the Finger Lakes of New York State. Each and every one of us who is Onondawaga belongs to one of eight clans. And I have the good fortune of belonging to the Heron clan. And the name they have given me is Gan Nonza Tehtel. It really refers to responsibilities I have within our ceremonial way of life. Uh, I'm a faith keeper within the uh, Gananda Se, Ganosaske, or the Newtown Longhouse. Um, I, I feel a great uh, <laughs> need to, to come up with something. <laughs> powerful and meaningful for us to say today, to start our meeting with. But I want to just share a quick experience that I had yesterday. I went out to PS1 to see a show uh, by Daniel Lynn Ramos, quite an amazing show, a, a Puerto Rican artist uh, or an, an artist from the island of Puerto Rico. And um, on the way back, I caught a number seven train. It was the brownest train I have ever been on. I'm not kidding. The brown outnumbered everyone else on that train. And you know, I am quite used to seeing Mayan faces. But on that train, I saw faces of indigenous people, and I'm not sure where they were from, you know. And I, one, was one guy was standing right in front of me, and I had the greatest curiosity to, to look at him, but not be rude, and at the same time want to ask him, man, where are you from? <laughs> Because, you know, and then I, I saw very brown people with very large suitcases. So they are some of the people who are being bussed here, dropped off, and then they're left on their own. Some of them don't speak Spanish, don't speak English, speak only their indigenous language. That's a, that's a challenge in New York City. The subway system is a challenge, let alone, you know, just where do you go? What do you do? But it is an indication that New York remains this kind of magnet, for better or worse, for people from all over you know, the world, and especially this hemisphere. And that's been so for a very long time. You know, the Mohican took Gahande, uh, this river behind us that Henry Hudson gave his name to, was known by the people who lived here as the Mahicantuck. And, and it was, to us, Manhattan was a place of endless resources, 
as he mentioned, as Adam mentioned, great oysters, all kinds of shellfish in the area, hunting and fishing, abundant here. And people came here, and no one owned it. No one owned the island. That idea was not even part of the lexicon. The island was open to all the people who came here for whatever resources they need, and it was a place for trading. I, I created a number of artworks when I lived in New York in which I really emphasized Broadway because Broadway runs the length of the island. It kind of runs right down the middle of the island. And it was an Indian trail, right? And down here at the kind of the foot of the trail, what we call Wall Street was literally a wall, a wall intended to separate the Ungwehongwe from the Dutch. The Dutch didn't really want us hanging around their place. And yet they wanted a treaty with us in order to trade for fur for the beaver pelt. And that was one of the very first things they did. And, and we formed a treaty with them that we called the Two Row. And it's a very simple treaty to read because it is a series of uh, three white lines of beads with two parallel purple lines. And that signifies that the Dutch are traveling in a ship. And in their ship, they have everything they need. They have their language, they have their law, they have their belief, they have their knowledge. It's all in their ship with them. But likewise, pa traveling parallel to them and traveling into the future are the Ongwehongwe, or the original people who made it, the Ganyanke Haga, the Mohawk. And the Ganyanke Haga had in there their Guyanus Hatgawa, their great law. They understood that. They had their language. They had their knowledge of the plants and the trees and the medicines and the animals and the birds of this place. All of that was there with them. And all we asked was, don't try to jump out of your ship and steer our canoe. And we're not going to get out of our canoe to steer your ship. <clears throat> we're going to travel forward in time with the notion that we can live in peace and friendship forever so long as we can respect the right of each to exist. And we tried to extend that tenet to the French and to the English and to the Americans and to New York State. And after a while, they used to say to us, please don't bring that belt with you anymore. Because it reminds us of all the things that we once agreed to that we no longer can agree to, right? To be equals, to be uh, respectful of one another. Such a simple thing. And somehow or other, that got lost. And I think Joe kind of put his finger on it, you know. Capitalism, individualism, and all of that replaced this idea of community. And community is such an essential understanding that we are all members of a much larger community, but we're all members of our individual communities. And we have a responsibility to the members of our community and we have a community here this morning. And I feel a great responsibility to this community this morning. You know, we, Jean and I, I don't, I think I can say this. We, we built a foundation. We built a foundation by the work that we did. And it was all intended to give opportunity to artists. And to artists who came from, whether they came from the Southwest, the Northeast, the Northwest, Alaska, or wherever they may have come from, we wanted to give them opportunity. We didn't know how they might be received here, but we wanted to have their work seen here, and then people can decide. And always there was one artist or two artists who kind of stood out, and, and this was a beginning for them. And there were a few artists who actually gave a damn about what New York thought. Not all, you know, not all were working with that thought that I want to show in New York. Not all at all, uh, but a few did. And it was always quite fun to, to see how excited they got about the opportunity to show uh, on West Broadway in Soho when the gallery was there. It was quite fun. And, and as Jean mentioned last night, it was all done on a shoestring. Uh, but there were some people who were very helpful. And Jolene Rickard is one of them. 
uh, Rosemary Richmond, Michael Bush, Jesse Coudé. They were very helpful. They gave a lot of time, but as did John, George Longfish, Edgar Heepa Birds. Each of them contributed to the success of the gallery that I ran. So we had that sense of community and, and one of our artists has been fortunate to kick open the door here at the Whitney. And uh, now your responsibility, those of you who are younger than she and I, is to keep that door open, whether you have to keep your foot in it or <laughs> whether you have to pound on it, whatever you're gonna do, you have to keep it open, right? This is, uh, there's no guarantees. There are no guarantees. And uh, I, the, the last thing I wanna say, I'm gonna steal a little line from my good friend, Oren Lyons, is that uh, nature has its laws and its laws are absolutely uncompromising. The natural world is going to proceed as it is proceeding and it really is uncompromising. The changes that are coming to the natural world and that are present right now are, are not going to worry, worry about whether Donald Trump gets elected or doesn't get elected or whether, you know, there's a Democrat in there or there's a Republican in there. The natural law does not care about any of that. And we have to somehow continue to insist that as Joe also said, we are an integral part of it, but we're no more important than the turtle. We're no more important than the deer, the heron. We are, if we're lucky, at least a part of it and, a, and have the time to enjoy it throughout our lifetime. I wish you all the very best today and look forward to a great conversation with everyone who is here. Daniho Diai, Daniho. I'm just going to welcome uh, Corky Claremont, right? Okay, um, who's a special addition to the program. So we're so thrilled that you could join us today. On the well, I'm not sure. well, it's just a great honor and privilege, you know, to be here. You know, I'm, I'm truly humbled. And I appreciate the words of my elders, and everyone here that, that spoke and, and gave a recognition to this community, this tribal community. As uh, tribal people and people, you know, we spoke of our relationship and we really believe in the circle. You know, we talked about the wheel last night a little bit, uh, about not having the wheel. Well, we had the, the great wheel, the, the circle, because we're all connected and part of that. All colors are connected to part of that. And that circle, of course, came from the Creator. You know, He put everybody down here and uh, gave us different colors for, uh, for good reason. I'm not sure why, but, but uh, I just assumed everybody would be red. Um, but anyway, uh, we're all gathered here, and, and I guess it reminds us that uh, each of us has a role to play in a thing that we're supposed to be doing. And it was mentioned, being a part of the natural order, Those that came before us, as is mentioned, they know what they're supposed to do, you know. And then man came, and, and they're all our helpers, right? Uh, so we always have to respect what's there around us, because they're our helpers, and they're our medicines, they tell us things, and, and we learn from them. You know, and I, <laughs> you talk about different peoples, a variety of things. You know, it's real easy to, to see it out here. When you go in our area where you have a forest and it's full of trees, all the trees are different. But they all have a purpose. 
and they're different because that's how it has to be. Because if you have a, uh, something coming into that forest, uh, there's going to be some trees that'll be resilient. They're not going to die because of a bug or a disease or something. They're going to be resilient and they'll maintain that beautiful forest. So that's, that's the way you are as people, you know. We're all different because we all have our place and we're all needed. We're all dependent on one another. So diversity is the strength. It's our strength. And our tribal people, because as I've mentioned, you know, uh, been here for thousands of years, uh, we have this special connection with the land with all of our ancestors that were here before, that have gone on, but they remain here. Because as Jean was saying last night, they're part of the ground. They're the, they're the uh, what make up the ground, and that's what the plants and everything is nourished from, and, and we continue to be nourished. So, so their spirits are always here around us and are always going to support us. And that's that special connection that we have that we can offer the new people that come into our lands, our territory. And I have a great respect for the First Peoples here. You know, I, I really enjoyed hearing the, uh, about the First Peoples here. You know, it, uh, uh, it was good to hear because, uh, you know, we think about those things where we're from too. I'm, from the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, as is John, you know, we're, we're related, as a lot of our tribal people are, you know. <laughs> but, uh, and we find we're related to a lot of tribal people from other places too, because of our interactions in different times, or powwows, or feasts, and celebrations. And so I find cousins in a lot of different. Uh, tribal communities, you know, that I really didn't know about, but uh, you learn to know. Uh, so th that's, those connections are so, so warm and so embracing and so, so good. <laughs> so I want to give thanks to Adam, especially Adam, um, who I've just come to love. He's so, so special. And, um, I want him to stay in my life. And of course, Joe Baker, you've uh, been in my life for many years and I appreciate you being here. Pete, dear Pete, I mean, you you are my brother. Yeah, and Corky, Corky you are too. I give thanks uh, for all my tribe, the matriarch, strong old woman, quick to see, Marie Rose Delorme Smith, my matriarchs, I give thanks for the ancestors, to those who are uh, here, those yet unborn. I give thanks for the Whitney and its brilliant staff. Uh, and um, I thank Scott Rothkoff, David Breslin, and David Keel, who have been so kind and so supportive to my incredible son, Neil Ambrose Smith, who is my mentor, my teacher. Um, and this title, Sharing History for the Future, um, I just wanted to say that um, I have a, a poem here. When I leave, when I leave this place, I mean when I go on my last journey. Um, when Coyote and Amat can call me home. Here's where I'm going. I'm going to be a drop of rain. I'm going to be the mist in the fog. I'm going to be the glint on wood tick. I'm going to be a grain of manumen. I'm going to be the hair on grizzly. I'm going to be a scale on salmon. I'm going to be a thread of black moss. I'm going to be the yellow eye of the coyote. I'm going to be the pollen on corn silk. I'm going to be a bract of bitterroot. I'm going to be the shaft of a feather. I'm going to be the whisker of a wolf. I'm going to be the sphagnum in muskeg. I'm going to be the waddle on a tom. 
I'm going to be the calyx on a service berry. I'm going to be the speckle on a magpie egg. I'm going to be the stick and mud of beaver. I'm going to be the keratin of elk horn. I am related. I am related. I am related. I am related. That's where you'll find me. Um, and uh, I have um, I have a history of the United States. Uh, we've been talking about that this morning, but I I've shortened it for you today. <laughs> so you know, laughter brings out the endorphins. So it's so good for us. So my history of America is that Snow White came from Europa. She kissed the frog who turned into a ledger book prince. She converted corn into Fritos and soon she put everything up for sale. <laughs> so now I have um, something special I would like to do. Um, I would like uh, Corky and Linda to come here to the stage, please. And would Laura and Laura Phipps and Caitlin come forward, please? OK, just, just come to the stage up here. Um, you know, where there's a spot there. OK. Laura. I give thanks to Laura Phipps for consenting to go on this journey with me for five years, daily, <laughs> weekly, in a tireless archaeological dig that neither of us were sure about what if, or if we could even turn up enough work for an exhibition, would there be enough? But Laura was prodigious, prodigious and stayed the course. And as she went, she visited native exhibitions in this country, in Canada. She visited my reservation. She read native writers. You could say it was an immersion project. I'm so grateful to you, Laura, to have shared this time and experience with you and to see the exquisite outcome of what's been produced. I am so honored and proud to have taken this journey with you. And now I honor you with this blanket. Caitlin. <laughs> Caitlin, dear Caitlin, our journey together began at Bard when you searched in the library and you found scant information about an unknown artist named Quick to See and you wanted to know more. Now in this journey, after scanning 78 boxes of archives, cataloging <laughs> and helping with the catalog, you are expert on my work. I'm so honored and proud to have taken this journey with you. And now I honor you with this blanket. Wait, wait, am I hearing something? Is there, yes. wait, what is it? Wait, oh my goodness, I think, I think Coyote escaped from the reservation. Oh my God, oh, I'm so, oh, 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 yeah. oh, oh, goodness, oh, oh. Oh, what shall we do? <laughs> A funny thing happened to me on my way over here. I ran into Christopher Walken. And you know what he said? More cowbell. <laughs>